I don't know if we're going to get to complete clarity here, but hopefully I'll give you a framework of sort of thinking about these injuries and, and how to sort through them and treat them effectively. Uh, sorry, I'm technically not doing so well. So about 50% of these injuries occur between C5 to 7. I would make a special note of the uh, metabolic bone conditions such as ankylosing spondylitis. You need to have a really high index of suspicion for these types of injuries. They break like long bones. If there's any fracture, it's probably unstable because they break right through the entire spinal column. Uh, also, don't forget to consider uh, the assessment of uh, bone density and uh, bone quality. Um, maybe less important in the cervical spine, but nonetheless uh, likely important. Athletic injuries are also common in the US. Football, wrestling, gymnastics are the big ones. Europe, rugby, Canada, ice hockey. So I'm not going to go through an in-depth or detailed discussion of the grading scales or scoring systems or classification systems. The SLICS is one that was mentioned earlier. It's a very good one. I think it, it uh, is very good on the ends of the scale for predicting you know, when surgery is not needed, when surgery is needed. It's that middle ground where I think experience comes in. It's the, you know, the fours. Uh, where it's not always clear, and it's that intermediate group where I think you have to use uh, some of your experience and, and knowledge perhaps outside of just sort of going through all of the numbers. I personally can't remember all of the numbers. I think the residents going through training are kind of more adept at doing that. Uh, of course, Dr. Araby here was uh, one of the uh, uh, investigators on the development of this led by uh, Dr. Vaccaro. Uh, Dr. Chapman was also or has been involved uh, highly with the AO uh, spine group. I'd like to make a distinction here, and this is really a classification system and not necessarily a grading scale or a grading score. It goes into things a little bit more in detail uh, with uh, four categories, uh, looking at morphology, uh, facet injury, neurological injury, and then there are modifiers and there are four uh, modifiers that are sort of special conditions, uh, disco or uh, a posterior capsular uh, ligamentous injury that is incomplete, a significant disc herniation, vertebral artery injury, um, and the other is uh, metabolic bone conditions like angspon. We talked a little bit earlier in the course about x-rays. They're really not uh, used that often. Uh, now the protocol is pretty much CT for everything. Uh, but remember to look at the entire CT. You know, this was a case where you might get stuck on the subluxation there at 3-4 when there's a burst fracture also uh, down at uh, 7. So make sure you examine the entire uh, uh, set of images. Um, Flexion, uh, rotation injuries, uh, unilateral facet dislocation. A lot of these patients will have an associated radiculopathy. Uh, it can be missed. Uh, there's a classic bow tie sign on an x-ray um, or the reverse hamburger sign. Um, I've learned a lot from the, oops, sorry, the, uh, my orthopedic colleagues on this about reduction. You have to recreate the injury to, accurate, to uh, successfully reduce these injuries if you're going to do it um, closed. So you have to flex and rotate the head and then extend it and derotate. Uh, a 50% success rate for reduction is perhaps a little bit low. I think it can be done probably a little bit higher than that. But one of the points I'll make here is that I think it depends on your institution. I can tell you that at my institution, doing a closed reduction is uh, almost impossible in the emergency department. It's a little bit of an eight ring circus in the ICU because we're just not set up for that. Um, so a lot of these cases I will take to the operating room. I'll talk a little bit more about timing. I think we had a good discussion of that uh, yesterday as well. Uh, this was a case uh, that I learned a lot from. Um, and maybe if I had studied the AO classification system a little bit more, I might have been able to to come up with a little bit of a better plan. But this was actually the husband of my uh, surgical scheduler. He was involved in a motorcycle accident. He had an injury to his rotator cuff and, and then this cervical spine injury, unilateral facet fracture. He had some neck discomfort. He had a little bit of numbness in his thumb, but no weakness and, and really was not, not in much 
you know, not in much pain. He was being managed with a cervical collar. I said, all right, you know, this is a, this is a well-aligned facet fracture. I'm going to try to keep you in the collar for, for a few weeks, and let's, let's check on it. Let's see what happens. So he comes back. Here's his x-ray. He's subluxed at 5'6", and, uh, you know, I had sort of, uh, I guess, maybe underestimated the, uh, the degree of this injury. Got an MRI scan. He's got a disc herniation at C5-6 that um, uh, migrates uh, rostrally behind the, the five vertebral body. Uh, I don't have the axials here, but he also had a pretty good disc herniation at C4-5. So this was a case where I ultimately ended up taking him to surgery after you know, seeing that. Um, and this was the, the construct with the corpectomy given that disc behind the, the vertebral body. Um, I think he probably could have done a two-level ACDF, maybe try to take the disc out, but I, I personally felt more comfortable doing this. Got a big harms cage in there and, uh, and a plate. Um, I don't think you need posterior stabilization. I'm keeping a pretty close eye on him. Uh, he had good bone quality. Uh, this is a, uh, another uh, unilateral facet injury, but this is a case of a floating facet there at uh, C6. Uh, the, the patient uh, was neurologically intact. He, he really didn't have any radicular pain. I did have an MRI scan. Uh, it did show some posterior ligamentous complex injury above the, the five six segment. Um, and he also had some spondylosis there as well. So I did elect to do kind of a long posterior construct. I think you could probably argue that I, I might have been able to go shorter. Could you combine it with an anterior and a posterior shore? Um, but, uh, you know, he was 70 years old, and uh, I, I felt that this was a, a reasonable option. He had no um, facet to, um, to place instrumentation in on the, on the side of the injury at, at C6 there, so I ended up going a couple of segments longer. So a 20-year-old uh, kid who uh, unfortunately fell down a flight of steps, was found at the bottom of the steps, had this complete spondyloptosis at C6-7. Um, take note of the uh, lamina here, had an Asia A injury. Um, I think the spinal cord was probably transected in this case almost uh, certainly. I did not get an MRI. Um, I think the case for an MRI in these types of uh, dislocations is probably more important in an incomplete injury. And we'll talk a little bit more about that, but for me, um, I, I felt that the, the first thing that needed to be done is to get this guy stabilized. So again, the emergency room, not a good place at our institution. I know at places like Harborview, they can do it very uh, easily. Put him in traction right away in the emergency room. Uh, but I took him right to the OR. Uh, just a couple of other uh, CT cuts. Uh, we were able to get him lined up actually relatively easily because of the extent of the, of the uh, uh, instability. Uh, got him lined up pretty nicely to, to do an ACDF at that level uh, and then uh, turned him over uh, and did, uh, again, a, fair, a little bit more of a longer segment fusion. Um, could it be limited? Maybe. I just felt like uh, this was a pretty unstable injury. Uh, this is just the post-op. So here's another one. Uh, now, remember how the lamina looked on the last one? This is another 20-year-old kid, came in completely intact. Little bit of radiculopathy, little bit of weakness in one hand. The difference here is on that first case, um, the, the, th this guy essentially has a traumatic uh, you know, bilateral uh, spondylolysis. And so the lamina stayed back. And he's got a pretty large spinal canal. And that's what allowed him to be intact. So here's a guy who's, who's completely intact. He's got a very unstable injury. You know, the question then becomes, do you take him to the MRI scan? Well, I just said a minute ago, you can make the case for doing that in an incomplete injury. I'm worried about taking this guy anywhere um, with that kind of injury and, and not causing something to get worse. So again, I, I also took him immediately to the operating room. I was not able to get him reduced completely, and I'll show you the x-rays in a second, in a closed fashion. Uh, 
So I ended up having to uh, go to the back and do a long construct uh, from the back in an open uh, reduction. Now, remember, I told you to look at the entire CT scan. So he's got a burst here, burst pathology at C3, and a fracture through C2 as well. And you'll see, unfortunately, I did extend his con construct all the way up to C2 in this case. But this was the uh, intraoperative fluoro in the supine position uh, here with uh, up to 75 pounds of traction. You can see he was still perched. And I personally, at that point, he was starting to really distract. And given that he was intact, I was done, doing it with neuromonitoring. And he was, he was still, you know, neuromonitoring was normal. Uh, but I was worried about putting more weight on than that. And we talk about 10 pounds per level or so, C7, T1. Um, I know people will go as high as 140 pounds. So we can talk about it later. But, but I sort of felt like at that point I was going to stop and just do an open uh, reduction and fixation. And uh, so we were able to... Uh, to do that. Uh, and this is his uh, standing films. He's doing well. He actually is about ready to go back to work. Uh, one question would be, you know, should I go in, cut the rods, and uh, take the instrumentation out above where he had the C2 and the C3 injuries? I think you could make a case for that young guy. Um, I don't know if it, you know, another operation through his poster, you know, muscle attention uh, band, it may not be a good idea either, but, but that's open for discussion, I think. So um, we talked about MR imaging, and um, you know, for me, I, I think it's very rare that you're gonna get into a situation where you're gonna, you're gonna get into a trouble with reduction uh, prior to MR imaging. And, and there are a lot of studies on this. This is uh, probably the most recent one that I was able to find uh, done this year, meta-analysis, uh, looking at 197 patients, all of whom had MR imaging. And then uh, there were six studies where they either had an open reduction or they had a closed cranial cervical traction. And out of the 197, oh, and they also had to have a demonstrated disc herniation. Sorry about that. Um, there was only one case where there was any kind of reported neurological worsening. Uh, when traction was done uh, in that setting. So for me, I think reduction is the fastest way to decompress the neurological system, the nervous system. And I think there's going to be a low probability of injury in that case or worsening in that case. So just to finish up, some, some kind of take home points. Um, I think the grading scores and the classification systems are great, and it's good to have an understanding of those. Um, but I think it's a little bit more than that. Um, you really have to do a great exam, uh, consider your imaging, do they need an MRI scan, and then can a neurological deficit be reversed? Um, if there's a dislocation, you can do that very quickly with reduction, whether you prefer doing it in a closed setting or intraoperatively. For me, it's almost always intraoperatively. For me, again, I'm not going to get an MRI most of the time. Um, Assessing stability, again, these scales are nice, the classification systems are nice. They give you a framework to, to as, a, as sort of a base to work on. But I think, I think then ultimately experience uh, is what's gonna help you determine operative versus non-operative management. Uh, think about uh, some of the uh, uh, modifiers uh, from the AO system. Osteoporosis is important, look at ang spawn cases. You have to have a high index of suspicion for those being unstable. If you're not sure, you know, I made a mistake on that first case I showed perhaps, but you're never wrong. I always tell our trainees and residents, you're never wrong putting the patient in a collar, following them closely, get serial x-rays, and over time you'll usually tell if, you know, if there's an, if there's an instability there. Um, if it's unstable, Figure out what the best approach is in your hands to accomplish the goals of decompression of the neural elements, realignment of the spine, and stabilization. Sometimes a good rule of thumb is to go where the pathology is. If there's a disc herniation that's critical, retropulsion of bone fragments, you know, maybe an anterior approach or combined anterior posterior approach is what you're going to do.
Um, if there's a large component of a disco ligamentous or posterior ligamentous complex injury, I sort of like to or prefer to, to stabilize those through a posterior approach. Um, is reduction required? Again, as I mentioned, whatever is most efficient for you, closed or open, I don't think you need an MRI scan most of the time. We'll stop there. Thanks. One quick question, really nice survey and beautiful cases. Dr. Richard Schwent wants to know, again, Asia A patient, do you still bother with an MRA or a CTA if there's like in that one case that you showed a strong suspicion of a vertebral artery disruption? Yeah, I, you know, what's the treatment? Um, it's an aspirin. It's to prevent embolic stroke. So for me, I'm not, you know, I usually don't get a CTA, but I know there are arguments. Uh, against that. Why, why don't we do a straw poll? How many people would do a C, CTA, hands up? Jean, you're in there? Involuntarily, our radiology department just does it. <laughs> no, that doesn't count. We're not talking about radiology. Talking so about for those saying yes, what, how does it, does it change your management? Dr. Araby, you're the, you're the guru. Wait a minute. the degree of uh, vert injury. We know that we, with any grade of vert injury, there is 4% chance of small stroke in the cerebellum, okay? But we don't know uh, what grade of injury we are dealing with, grade one, two, three, or four. Our, you know, endovascular guys like to completely occlude if there is already occlusion of the vert, they would like to put a few stents also so that they would prevent migration of the... Um, and also for, for grades one or twos, we would like to foresee whether nothing, uh, three months, six months of aspirin or Plavix, I guess yeah. it helps a little. Yeah, no, I think it's, I think it's a good point. Um, I think, you know, I don't know if, if it changes the intraoperative or you know, your operative management, but perhaps afterwards if, if there's, you know, depending on the degree of injury to the, to the bony injury to the foramen transversarum, I think maybe you can make a decision at that point. Like Yen said, at our place, a lot of times it'll get done voluntarily by the radiologist. So Ted, but that is a good point. Yeah, Ted, you have the microphone? Yeah, I, I, it's a good talk, Tim. Uh, I, I don't think you need to apologize for stopping at 75 pounds of traction. Um, I know that people throw around that, that 140 number. Has anybody in this room gone to put 140 <laughs> pounds of traction on someone's neck? I, I right. um, so so uh, anyone who's tried to do this, uh, you know that when you start talking about large amounts of traction weights, there is a total art to that. Right, um, uh, you need to, uh, because once you start getting high, you start pulling the patient up to the head of the bed, you need to put them in reverse Trendelenburg, pull them all the way down, sometimes even tape them down. Um, I mean, it, there's an entire art to that. And so I don't think because there's a report in the literature that you could go that high, that you need to feel like you have to apologize for stopping <laughs> sooner than that. Um, it's also a recognized form of torture, right? Yeah. right? Right. right. <laughs> so uh, I, I just would uh, make that point. Uh, the, the other uh, the question that I had, though, was for those of you who treat these uh, uh, cervical uh, uh, jump facets uh, anteriorly, um, you're taken to the operating room. And I think the, the case you showed, I think, was supine with traction. And you said I stopped at 75 pounds or, or so. Right. Uh, at that point, exactly. uh, you have the patient under uh, awake or you have the patient under a general anesthesia? He's under anesthesia with neuromonitoring. Right. And, and maps, so, maps up. Right. And so that's the other uh, part of the art to close reduction is uh, you need to uh, relax this patient, right? When any of you who have tried to do this in the emergency room, right. um, the patient, their, their paraspinals are fighting you because they hurt and they're scared and they're fired up. And, right. and so- Great point. Uh, whether you have to give them a little bit of a benzodiazepine or just whisper in their ear or but but anything that you do needs to be uh, to try to calm them down because um, uh, 
I've had uh, more than a couple patients over the years where the residents would call me in the middle of the night and say, we're at 80 pounds and we can't get it. Yep. And I'd say, okay, yep. it's four o'clock in the morning. Let's stop. We'll just take them to the operating room tomorrow. Yep. And, and when we come back in, uh, in those couple hours, the nurses have left them. We've stopped messing with them. And then we get a, another lateral and they reduced. Why? Because they relaxed when they fell asleep and they slid back in. Yeah, that's, those are great points. And the other thing I wanted to add about that case where I couldn't do it supine, I couldn't, I, what I learned from that case is when I put the patient prone, I was recreating the injury because the lamina was floating. There, there wasn't any surgical manipulation that I was gonna do. To, what, I, what I actually ended up doing was scrubbing out, flexing the head and, and distracting, and then pulling it up and that's what, uh, that's what resulted in the reduction.